Good afternoon, United. Both in person and online, it's great to see you here today. And um, so just funny, funny. You set up a back row, people will sit in it. There's no, there's no doubt. So I, I love it. Um, yeah, today is a. Uh, one of our weekly United Chapels, and we're grateful that we get together as a spiritual community to hold and pray. And um, we're mindful today. I mentioned three things last week. I will include those three things again before we start. Um, the first is that we remember today in chapel in this space that there are families um, suffering in Florida and along the paths of Helene and Milton and um, many are students at United and we hold them all in our deepest prayer. And um, uh, hope that their safety is a first and foremost in their lives. Um, we also hold a uh, uh, former student, um, Jess Carter, in our prayers as she uh, moves in her hospice world um, to a transition to be a spirit love for all of us. Um, but uh, our hearts break at her passing um, whenever that happens. And we hold in prayer our beloved friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Jessica Chapman Lape, um, in these times of transition, and um, you will always be in our hearts. And so we are glad to honor you and to listen deeply to you today um, is, is our task. And so with those ideas and prayers um, in our hearts and minds, we open up our United Chapel. And I think Sana's first with a grounding reading experience of our time together. Something. Of something. Something. Hey. Hi. Yes, I graduated. <laughs> sort of right yes I know everyone asked me did you graduate I did graduate I do have an MDiv I haven't gotten their certificate but I do have that um today's reading is yes exactly today's reading is from the color purple which is my favorite movie in 1985 how many years is that there's no math people here right <laughs> it's 30 39 39 39 I don't have a good singing voice, so I can't sing it. Me and you, us never part, Maki da da. Me and you, us have one heart, Maki da da. Ain't no ocean, ain't no sea, Maki da da. Keep my sister away from me, Maki da da. Hello, everyone. Uh, when Dr. Chapman Lape asked me to introduce her today, my gut reaction was, hell yeah, of course. Uh, say less, of course I will. And then I eventually started thinking about how I wanted to introduce her. <clears throat> and I pondered the possibility of listing all her academic accomplishments and citing her significance in ways that you can read if those things matter to you. Uh, but what matters to me is the person she is. So I'm not going to introduce her uh, in typical academic fashion. I prefer to introduce her as I know her, as a brilliant scholar who is just beginning to scratch the surface of her own brilliance, despite how pronounced it already is, a colleague who I am grateful to have learned a great deal from and fortunate to have had the opportunity to think with on several occasions, but more importantly, a sister who I have grown to love and who I will sorely miss, who we all know and love and, uh, we, and we will miss because she has touched us in ways that we are better for. And for that, we should all be grateful and welcome Dr. Jessica Chapman Lake. Good afternoon. Yeah. So the short song that Sana beautifully read slash sang is from the 1985 cinematic rendition of The Color Purple, based on Alice Walker's prized text. A brief scene in the movie depicts a young Celie and Nettie, two devoted sisters, playing together in a field of purple flowers. As they play and sing this song together, their words promise one another that they would always have one heart. And as Celia Nettie's story unfolds, 
Their one heart sustains them through their future separation and the suffering that they each endured. The Color Purple is a powerful womanist work. It's a story about sisters, Black women loving themselves and one another fearlessly. It's a story that my sister Ashley and I hold dearly, as we too have one heart. So let me tell you about my sister, Ashley. Ashley Shakesha is my big sister, seven years my senior. Before I arrived, Ashley had grown comfortable as the youngest child amongst her and our older brother. So as we grew up, we rarely got along. Our mother would dress us in matching floral and lace dresses for church each Sunday. And I imagine a 12 year old matching her five year old kid sister <laughs> was not optimal for Ashley's pubescent sense of self. So we often argued, we bickered, we even once threw hands. But the funny thing about sisters is not only did we fight and fight hard, but we also laughed. We played, we danced, we shared music, and eventually traded clothes, makeup, and ideas. Once she was old enough on Sundays after church, it was Ashley's job to wash and braid my hair for the week. I would sit at her feet between her knees, and she would braid my hair the way our mother braided hers, and her mother braided hers, and her mother braided hers. It was sitting at my sister's feet that I learned how to be a womanist. I overheard her phone conversations with girlfriends. I listened to her colorful commentary about characters on MTV reality shows. I listened to her belt out tracks by Brandy and Whitney and Jill and India. I listened to her and my parents discuss race, class, culture, gender, and their varied intersections. Ashley was one of the only few black girls in her private San Diego school and I watched as she navigated, finding herself with the support of our family. Little did she know that watching her careful navigation as one of the only Black women inside of institutions provided me with a map for survival as well. My sister taught me how to be a womanist. She taught me how to love my hair, my skin, my body, my mind, and my spirit. She taught me how to love myself, and to love other Black women unconditionally. And while she braided my hair, she taught me the importance of my roots, of family and connection. Over the years, Ashley and I became best friends. I remember the day she told me she was pregnant. I was a freshman in college and she had just finished her Ivy League master's degree. And I was so excited that I immediately began to refer to her unborn child as ours. <laughs> Ashley moved from Pennsylvania to Virginia and had her son, Alonzo. I was living just a few hours away in North Carolina and suddenly my weekends were spent traveling to Virginia to be with Ashley and Zoe. Zoe and I had a beyond special bond. He learned to say auntie before he learned to say mommy. Oh. <laughs> it's true. He was mine and I was his. I was not only his auntie, but I was his godmother, his other mother. And I took my job very seriously. I was there at his soccer games, his birthday parties, and even his first haircut. My job was not only to co-parent Zoe for his sake, but to also support my sister as she always supported me. We were a womanist family unit, if you would. Two sisters caring for their child. In 2016, I moved from North Carolina back to Southern California to be with our parents and to begin my PhD program. While I was no longer physically present in our womanist family unit, I spoke to my sister and Alonzo every single day. Eventually, Ashley had another son, Mandela, and I never missed a beat in either or any of their lives. Fast forward to August of 2023. I received a call from my sister, a call that I never want to relive, yet relive often. Between screams and sobs, I heard her tell me that our beautiful Alonzo had died. He had just turned 14 years old. There are no words that sufficiently convey my grief. My heart 
Ashley and my one heart was shattered, broken into a million little pieces. This past year, as we grieved and remembered and prayed and cursed, my sister has needed me and I have needed my sister. As a chaplain, my spirit longs to care, longs to witness, longs to be present in the midst of grief and suffering. And I do that well inside of buildings and inside of hospitals. As a womanist, my spirit longs for justice and flourishing for black women and their families and their children. And I do that well inside of classrooms and book chapters and journal articles. Inside of institutions and systems and scholarship, I am known as a womanist chaplain. But if I do not care for my Black sister and our Black children and collectively cultivate their justice and their flourishing, a womanist chaplain, I am not. So I'm leaving. And I'm going to go stand on my womanist business and go do what I do best, which is care for Black women, including myself. This summer, my sister and I traveled to New Orleans. In our grief and our anger and our search for understanding, the Crescent City called our names and we chose to answer its beckon. Of course, we enjoyed ourselves. We stayed right on Bourbon Street and enjoyed strolling down bourbon and Frenchmen at all hours of the night. But what we really went for was to hear spirits speak. We wanted to go to the mouth of the Mississippi, a river our ancestors' blood flowed through, where the veil between life and death is thin and where the dead speak clearly to all those who listen. We traveled to greet the dead, to ask for wisdom and guidance. Our spiritual journey in New Orleans landed us right in Congo Square. Congo Square is a large shaded courtyard where enslaved Africans were allowed to gather for six hours on Sundays in the 18th and 19th centuries to dance, to laugh, to play, to drum, to trade, and to engage in cultural and spiritual traditions. Ashley and I pondered the joy that the enslaved community held in tension with their suffering. This community needed these six hours to survive. They needed to laugh and dance and sing so that they could survive the next 162 hours in deleterious confinement. They carved out time for care, for joy, for worship, and Ashley and I looked at one another and declared that we must do the same. Alonzo's legacy is not just our suffering. We might have 162 hours of suffering, but his legacy is our reunification of our family so that we may find joy and care and worship spirit together so that we can survive the grief and the anger and the pain. There in Congo Square, we poured libations, we touched the ground, we sang, we sat, we shaded ourselves beneath the wise old trees. And it was there that my sister and I decided that we would raise our children together and not leave each other's side again. So I'm leaving. And I'm going to stand on my womanist business and go do what I do best, which is care for Black women and our families and our children. And while I will miss this community dearly, I surely hope you can understand. So as I leave, may you always stand on business. May you always find your people. May you always live with an abundance of integrity. May you stay tethered to communities and not institution. May you find more than six hours of joy. And may you always, always remember your why. Ashe.
Good afternoon. <laughs> We're going a little off script today. <laughs> Sister, you've been on my mind. Oh, sister, we're two of a kind. So, sister, I've been keeping my eyes on you. I bet you think I don't know nothing but singing the blues. Oh, sister, I've got news for you. I'm something. I hope you think you're something too. Mm. United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities is constantly changing. People come and go. People commit themselves to one another loved ones and friends, students, professors, chaplains. <sighs> Graduate, move on, go to other jobs. Come and move on. Individuals move to communities and spiritual life. Others leave, move away to new places, new experiences and new opportunities. It is important and right to recognize these times of passage, of endings and beginnings. Today is one of those times to share in times of farewell to a dear friend who is leaving. On July 1st of 2021, United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities called Reverend Dr. Jessica Chapman Lape to serve as the Director of Interreligious Chaplaincy and Professor. I thank United, its members and friends for the love, kindness and support shown me these last three years. I ask for forgiveness for the mistakes I have made and I'm grateful for the ways my leadership has been accepted. As I leave, I carry with me all that I have learned here. Keep your thankfulness, all your forgiveness and accept that you now leave to minister elsewhere. We express our gratitude for your time among us. We ask your forgiveness for our mistakes. Your influence on our faith and faithfulness will not leave us at your departure. I forgive you and accept your gratitude, trusting that our time together and our parting are pleasing to God. Do you, people of United, release Reverend Dr. Jessica Chapman Lape from the duties of the professor? and Director of Interreligious Chaplaincy. Do you offer your encouragement for her ministry as Chaplain and Director of Spiritual Life and Social Justice in Pennsylvania? Do you, Reverend Des Jessica, Reverend Dr. Jessica Chaplain Lake, release this community from turning to you and depending on you? I do, with the help of God. Do you offer your encouragement for the continued ministry here and on the relationship of another who will come and serve? I do, with the help of God. As Romans 8, 38 says, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord, not death or life, not angels or rulers, not present things or future things, not powers or height or depth or any other thing that is created. On behalf of the Minnesota Conference of the United Church of Christ, I'm a witness to these words spoken, words of thankfulness, words of forgiveness and release. The member churches of our association and conference hold each of you in prayer. <laughs> Mm. 
Thank you, Jessica, dear sister and friend. Um, one of those uh, traditions in the uh, Black church and uh, in the worldwide African diaspora is to pour libations as a blessing to remember our ancestors. And one of the pieces that we learned that is taught in interreligious chaplaincy is to connect to your roots, connect to those people who have gone before. And so we're going to ask that as our closing ritual blessing today that we pour some libations. We remember the spirit of Sankofa, who has two feet grounded in the earth, facing forward into the future, but always looking back, remembering who brought us here and connecting us to those ancestral roots and stories that will keep us moving forward. And so with that spirit of Sankofa and libations, we offer a space. There's water, there's plants in different places. Um, as a blessing to remember your ancestors and to remember the great spirit that calls us all into deep relationships as you are sisters, brothers, siblings of one another. So please come and pour some libations. Remember where you came from and where you are going. Amen. Amen. For those at home, pour, pour. Find some water. Find a thirsty plant and pour. Amen. And while our chapel may be ended, our spiritual journey and being true to ourselves will never stop. Go in peace. We'll see you next Thursday. Some of you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>